So now everyone knows what that's all about. But why are we really here? Mostly it's because we want to, you know, get better at attacking, defending. Uh, we want to go to LobbyCon. We want to do Git, CTF, all that fun stuff. Uh, most of us are just afraid that Heidi will kick our butt if we don't show up. Um, but me, I'm here because I'm sort of a security tree hugger. I really want, you know, the whole world to get better. My dad always told me to, you know, leave somewhere better than where you found it. And since I'm alive, I kind of have to leave the world better than I found it. So let's start sharing the commonalities of attacks. This is my first defense talk, so this is, if, if uh, smoothballs, smoothballs start throw, get throwing at me, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but let's start caring about the commonalities of attacks, not IOCs, not when they already compromised us. And I feel that a lot of the security community has already given up on this. They've said, we're going to get hacked at some point. Let's worry about how to get them out. No, fuck that. I don't want that to happen. I, I want to stop them before they get in. So this is uh, hopefully working. All right, so first off is EMET. If you don't know what EMET is, I'm not going to go too far into it since it's um, already out there. But EMET's basically um, a Microsoft tool that's free that almost every enterprise should be using right now. And it, and it, and it forces, and it's opt-in, it forces security onto applications that are, are the most at risk. or um, whatever you configure it for. It's deployable by GPO and it basically makes a ton of these protections that are available stop anything from O days to old, old days to everything, right? Um, and it's free. Why aren't more organizations doing this? Well, it's a little bit hard to figure out and, and uh, deploy, um, but spend some time and, and just do it. Um, there are bypasses for these things, but every time you add a bypass, you're using another bug or you're adding some other things to these, um, to the uh, exploit. So these exploits, if they can get consecutively harder, makes it so that sometimes they just fail. They don't work. Those drive-by downloads or those drive-by exploits are never going to work where an where, uh, organization has email deployed, at least for right now. Obviously, security keeps on rolling through. Here's another good resource on EMET, specifically the 401 version, and some of the bypasses for that. Again, exploits, even with bypasses, even if they, ex they bypass one of those protections, they have to bypass two or three of those protections. Each, each thing that you make more difficult makes it so that um, you get less and less intrusions. So that's enough about EMET. Um, this next one is a little bit new, sort of. Um, I thought it was pretty nifty. I'd never heard of anyone doing it. But if you didn't know, a Java exploit is a little bit hard. Um, Java exploits don't always do memory corruption, so Emet's never, not always going to get everything there. But let me just explain how Java works in a browser. So Java, when you go to a malicious, uh, website, be it malicious or not, it tells a Java plugin that tells Java the binary to go get whatever code that it needs to run. Well, it does this using a user agent that is different from the Internet Explorer one. So if you go to this malicious website, you get a bunch of crap. This is Internet Explorer's awesome stuff. And, uh, but when Java is invoked to go get this stuff, it uses this. So you can actually tell on your proxy logs right now what versions all of your users are using and the attacker can as well. So if you don't want to block all Java user agents, and, you, and as I'm going to describe in a second here, and you just want to, you want to block the versions that are out of date, you can. It sends this information to whatever website is invoking Java. So this is what it looks like. I stole this picture from um, one of the Java exploits that has been posted online. And if um, we block that Java user agent, the, the user is never trusted to say, yes, this is good code, or no, it isn't. Because we all trust the users to make that decision, right? Yeah. So again, another free um, solution to this stuff, right? Um, 
what I'm going to see probably all of you like thinking in the back of your head, but I use Java applications, or Java applications are the developers and stuff like that. Well, if you pull a day, 30 days worth of proxy logs, you'll actually see that most of those Java applications are on one, two, three, or four domains. Java.com, Oracle.com, Sun.com, WebEx, and GoToMeeting. If you allow those to not be previewed to this block, you will block every single other domain exploit. So if there's a new domain or someone owns target.com and throws a malicious jar on it, you are still protected by this. So it's, it's a real quick um, fix. What's cool about this is it also works on SSL. So if you have a malicious website and it's SSL and you're not breaking SSL, the user agent is still going over um, in clear text. So you can say, no, Java, you're not allowed to invoke on any SSL sites because I don't trust you, or you're only to it on specific domains. And it protects Macs too, obviously, right? Java is cross-platform, and there are more Macs and Mac um, in the enterprise today. So if it's not Safari, it's usually Java that's getting exploited, and now you have a protection for it without ever having to configure or update or deal with developers who have to use Java 1.6.26 or their application broke. So that's it for that. Um, this one I'm going to get a little bit on top of a soapbox for. Um, everyone knows that negative logging or, or things that break is the things that you normally look at. Well, what happens if your AV vendor or your AV says, hey, I removed PW dump from an IIS server. Great! It did its job. Is that the end of the story? No, no, not at all. Um, the next one on this list is uh, login alerting. So um, how many of you do, like just a show of hands real quick, how many of you look through all of the successful logons on your enterprise? <laughs> That's what I thought. Well, there's a cool tool, and it's the only one I know of, so I apologize this is a paid for tool, but if there's others, uh, please let me know. Um, AD Audit Plus has this amazing ability to pull in all of the successful and unsuccessful logins and then, um, and then alert on specific things. So one organization I was pen testing, um, they actually had this set up and I used the local admin account on a bunch of different systems and they had alert saying if the local admin account authenticates to um, more than one system in a th set amount of time, I was caught. So um, I'm going to go a little faster because I got the 10 minute sign. HIPS, and please turn on the prevention part of that, AIPS. Um, Vuln scanning is what the tool do, does. Um, uh, this start vulnerability reporting, which basically means um, if you run Qualys, Nessus, and all of these other tools, and then give that report to the IT guys and say, this is important, fix this. That provides them no abilities, right? That, that, that tells them that you're useless, basically. So what you need to do is start um, looking through those things. And, and if you don't know how to, I mean, if you're just a VolnScan uh, person right now and you're like a mid to or low to mid level, go ahead and ask your pen test team to look through it. Like after they give you the report out, say, hey, could you tell me, here's our vulnerability scan for the last month or 10 months or whatever. Could you tell me what you would exploit if you had this previous to this pen test? you will get a ton out of that 30 minute assessment that you normally wouldn't. All of that experience all um, in one hit. So crowdsourcing security. Um, I've seen a lot more of this um, coming up, but I think that we need to push this a lot more at all over the organizations. Um, let's, let's turn every single one of our employees into, not our employees obviously, let's turn all of the people that work at the same company we do, um, into IDSs. Basically, you're, if you change security into an incentive program, um, you are then creating a contest, and then at the end of the month, you say, hey, the top X number of people who got points for sending in a fish get a $100 gift card. Don't make it a $5 gift card, because then people are not gonna even care. If you make it a $100 gift card or a $50 gift card, guess what? People are gonna start wanting to compete to get to that higher level, finding those security incidents, finding those phishing emails and sending them to you. Uh, internal bunk bounty program. The internal bunk bounty program stuff is great, but we need to extend this again to the entire organization. What we need to do is say, hey, if you, if you can change a one to a two and, use, and get from this account to another account and hopefully not go to jail for it, um, 
then please report that to X at company.com. Now the problem I see with most organizations is that they have a spam at whatever.com, they have a security at whatever.com, but once you send something there, it's a black hole. Nothing comes back. So let's make it easy, let's make it responsive, and let's make it incentivized. All right, um, uh, port forwarding honeypots. This is just a little idea on the side that I'm gonna go through quickly. Um, a lot of the honeypot ideas are um, CIOs, CSOs, and, the, and that such. Um, get really finicky when you tell them you're going to put something um, intentionally vulnerable on their infrastructure. Well, you can mitigate this a little bit by saying, hey, I got my main website. I'm going to port forward 1433 that doesn't exist or 8080 and then start a VPS somewhere and then have JBoss running on it unsecured and then you get to start looking at stuff without ever um, putting all of your infrastructure at risk. Um, everyone knows what WPAT is? Hopefully, nods, heads, yes. Um, this is actually my absolute favorite vulnerability because um, all you have to do is sit on a network for 20 seconds and you start getting requests in to WPAD um, asking for proxy settings. Then you provide those proxy settings to the attack or to the, the victims and guess what? You get to sit, tell them to where, go wherever you want, get their credentials and all this other stuff. This is such an easy fix and I don't know why more organizations don't do it. Um, 127001 DNS entry kills this from happening. Um, it's free as well. So uh, DNS, now I'm going to get a lot of boos or, or throws on this. Let's turn off DNS internally. Ooh, yeah, so you don't actually need DNS internally. You don't need it. Um, you don't need users to hit Google doc or to like ping Google or look up Google's IP address. If your proxies can already do that, they don't need to. Now, by removing DNS from uh, your DNS forwarders uh, entry, you're essentially taking a incomplete C2 infrastructure out of the picture. You're saying that no DNS C2 will ever work in my organization because I don't have DNS internally. Your proxy, everything that's proxy aware can get through. You can make exceptions for that. Um, and and uh, again, this is just one setting inside of Microsoft DNS to, to make this not work anymore. And that's it. Uh, I stole this from Chris Gates, but dumping your, um, um, your hashes, please, please, please start doing more password auditing inside of your organizations. Um, if you don't know how to do password auditing and you get a pen test every year, tell your pen testing, hey, we're going to give you all of our hashes, please try and crack them. They'll jump at the process. You, if you do it in a, in a supervised way, you will find out that a lot of your organization have really bad passwords, and then you can just lock them out, give a comment in the, in the user field saying this is locked out because of this, and that's it. Uh, authenticating splash proxies. Um, so who, just as a raise of hands, who, in, who, has, who works for an organization that has a proxy? Raise your hand. That has their stuff through a proxy. How many of you have proxies? Now keep your hands raised. How many of you have proxies that authenticate, like use your username and credentials and stuff to get through? Not that many. How many of it actually take those credentials from your Windows logon so you, that, that the user don't have to do it? Why? The, uh, the attacker, all they have to do is add one line of C code to whatever malware they have to, to just use those same credentials to do it. If you make it a web form instead and say, hey, you have to you know, put in into this web form, which humans can do, the attacker isn't going to really be able to automate that very easily. This is an easy fix. Um, block all on and categorize is, is a default. Yes, we should all do this. Um, but if you can't, if you don't, if you're a small to medium business, um, I would implore you to use Squid or something else that can create a splash page. And what I mean by a splash page is, is simply this, a, a proxy that every day it makes everything blocked. Or every week it makes everything blocked. And then when your user comes in and wants to go to bob.com, they get this page instead and says, do you really wish to unblock this page for the entire company? And they say, yes or no. And then, then it's unblocked for the entire company. Oop, I got, are we back? Yeah, okay. So then it's unblocked for the entire company. Facebook, whatever, is un unblocked for the entire company. So then, guess what? No C2 is ever going to actually work. There, it, there's no way for a, a meterpreter or, or a uh, ghost rat to figure out how to push the unblock on this thing. 
right? And if you're, if you're blocking the whole thing every week or every day, you're going to stop a lot more stuff. The other cool thing is you're putting a little bit of a psychological bend on them saying, hey, you're going to unblock this for the entire company. You sure you want to do this? So this is the fun part. This is where I get to have a little bit of fun. Um, these are evil canaries, things that I've seen in pen tests that really pissed me off because I got uh, uh, caught because of them. The first one is, well, there was a domain user, a domain admin, actually, that the, in the description, it had the password. I was like, yay, easy. Um, the logon hours were zero, and it actually had a specific logging for anyone ever using that account to automatically send a critical alert. <laughs> Guess how many times I tried that account? <laughs> a lot. Um, There's also a public share on another test that I saw that said password audit 2014 or pass whatever the year was. And inside of that, that share, it was open to everyone. Anyone could go into it. Inside of that share was one document. It was a CSV file with password dump.csv. I was like, oh yeah, done. It was four megs. I thought I was golden. Guess what? There was specific logging on that one file and it um, had an everyone deny on the permissions. So guess how many times I clicked on that? A lot. Another one, a little bit of an esoteric one, is the, a computer called Backup Database with a really out of date version of MySQL that they removed the DLL for authentication. So guess how many times I tried to authenticate? A lot. Um, this one was actually not done by a security guy. There was a web developer that thought it was absolutely funny that he made an HD access file that forwarded all the common scanner or web scanner um, requests. Like, so a normal user would never see this, but a scanner would come back with a bunch of 402 pages, and anyone who knows HTTP codes knows that that's a payment required. So he was basically telling everyone who tried to scan his website, pay me. <laughs> um, another one that pissed me off was the credit card database. So, got into like domain admin and all the, all the fun authentication, got into their payment processing center or their, their database. No, it wasn't Target. Um, so got into the payment processing and went into the database. There was a huge Oracle database. One database said credit cards. I was like, done, easy. It was actually set up by the database admins um, that had you know, all these fake credit cards and, you can, and they dumped them all from um, getcreditcards.com and made this fake database that no one ever accessed. And then alerting was turned on on that one database, and guess what? Caught. Um, the other one, another one that really pissed me off was there was a VPN page that allowed, uh, that had a default set of credentials in the HTML code. It actually says, like, it was commented out saying, here's the default way to log into this VPN. Of course, I tried them. It, did, it actually allowed me to log in, but guess what? No access, caught. Um, and a couple others, uh, don't, I'll go through these, uh, you can see them on the slides, but um, since I don't have very much time, one of the things that I really wanted to get to at the end of this was tell your help desk. Now, all of us as security people think about, hey, I don't know how to talk to management, I got to talk to management, I got to talk to management. I got to figure out how to get them to get buy-in. The problem is that a lot of the help desk people get all of the crap that we throw in and we don't tell them how to deal with this. So if you put the splash proxy in, then, um, and you leave them out of the loop, or the Java block, or something like that, then you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're, you're taking someone who's in the front lines of it, uh, of, those, of those types of security things, and, and removing their ability to help you. And that's it. Thank you to Heidi, Bruce, Schmoostaff, and the countless people that listen to me ramble on about this every single time I tried to practice for this, because it is really intimidating to all the people that are in here right now. And that's me. Uh, thank you very much, and have a nice day. What is this? Cupcakes. Thank you.